At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Elah, Elah, Lama, Sabatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain and the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the Son of God. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him. They fell into a dead faint. The angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. He is risen. Well, good morning. It's so great to be with you on this Easter Sunday as we revisit this story and spend some time worshiping and celebrating what our God has done for us and for the world. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thanks for joining us, especially if you're online. Thank you for being here with us. We're glad to have you. We're glad to all be united as God's church together. Let's pray before we get into our time in the Word. Father, this morning, we're so thankful for all that you have done. We pray that as we come here, that you would meet us with your presence, that we would be face to face with you. Father, that we would see you, that we would give thanks, that we would understand what it is that you did for us, such a precious and loving and sacrificial thing. Father, we're so thankful that you have the power to conquer and overcome death so that we too can overcome death, that we can live forever with you, but that we can be united in relationship with you. God, help us to see you and experience you this morning. In your name, amen. Well, we've been going through a series on why the Bible matters. And today we are concluding that very fittingly as we come to talk about the power that the Bible has. The Bible, God's word, the good news is so powerful, so helpful to us as we've looked at and as we studied together. We saw the first week just how distinct and unique God's word is, how authoritative it is. It has authority over our lives and authority over the whole world. And that authority comes from Jesus himself and what he's done on the cross, what we're here to celebrate today. His word is also so authentic. It's real. It's the real thing. It's not fake. It's something that we can put our full trust in as we come to know God better. And last week we talked about the beauty and the excellence of God's word. It is so much better, so much more wonderful than any other thing. Nothing else satisfies the way that God does or the way that his word does when we interact with it. And this morning we're talking about the power of his word that comes from this story of the gospel on this Easter Sunday as we celebrate our risen Lord. When I was much younger, uh, my family lived in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, and I remember one particular time, I was about six or seven, and we were out playing at the park, and I remember they had one of those really tall metal slides that I don't know why they ever made, because it doesn't feel good to slide down and you get stuck. And when the sun's out in Kansas, which it is all the time, it's very hot and it burns you, all these things, right? So I don't know why I remember these details, but I'm, we're at the park, we're having a good time, and I remember... We look up at the sky and it starts to turn kind of green and it's getting darker and the clouds are swirling. And in Minnesota, that doesn't mean too much, but in Kansas, it means something powerful is coming. 
And we all know, we all know the signs to look for because it happens all the time. So my mom sees that and she says to us, we need to go home. We need to get home. It's not safe to be at the park anymore. So we get in the car and we drive home. And we, of course, we go down to the basement and we check the weather. And sure enough, there's a tornado coming. And we hunker down. And thankfully that day, nothing happened to our house. But one of my friends, one of my good friends, well, we were six, so. One of my first friends told me the story the next day of what happened to his family. They lived out on the edge of town, and they were sitting down for an early dinner. And they could see the sky was dark, but they didn't see anything else. And he described that as they're sitting there, things started to shake on the table. And it sounded like there was a train moving through the backyard. It had so much power and so much strength that as soon as they heard this and experienced this, immediately their dad knew and got them all down to the basement. But he was the last one to go down. And just as he was closing the door down in the basement, the wind came and pushed so strong that it shoved him all the way down to the bottom. Now, they were fine. They survived. But the force and the power of this storm completely took their house and moved it all over the neighborhood. And nothing was left but the foundation. There are a lot of powerful things in our world, like this tornado, and many of the powerful things we interact with bring destruction with them. Whether it's any other kind of natural disaster, this morning uh, Martin was telling me all about volcanoes and, and, and what they do. And we've seen stories about hurricanes and massive blizzards and tsunamis and all these things that have such sheer power when they move into our life, but oftentimes they bring destruction. And this isn't the only kind of power. I was looking up uh, some of the spiciest peppers and foods out there, and I don't like spicy food. Like barbecue, mild barbecue sauce, like sweet barbecue sauce, that's the end of the line for me. I can't handle any more than that. Classic Minnesota, you put ketchup on it, you call it a spicy burger. But there is a pepper in America called the Carolina Reaper pepper that apparently is so spicy that when someone consumes it, at minimum, you get the hiccups because your body has to have some kind of response, but at most, you just can't keep it down because it's too hot and too spicy and just lights you up. There's all kinds of things that have power. Words have power. Words have the power to bring us doubt and discouragement. They also have the power to lift us up and to be life-giving and to encourage us. God's word has so much power but unlike so many of these other things, it has the power to heal, to rebuild, to restore, and to redeem, to bring hope into our lives. And that's the kind of power that we're looking at this morning as we look at the power behind the Bible. And it gets its power from all of these things that we've just talked about. It gets it from the distinctness, the authority, the authenticity, the beauty but most importantly, it gets its power from the story of Jesus, the story of the cross, the story of the resurrection, of God overcoming death. The gospel is at the center of the power behind God's word. Now, there's two things I want to talk about this morning when we consider the power of God. And the first one is it has the power to rescue us, to save us, to redeem us, to make us right as we stand before God. But it also has the power to sustain us to keep us moving towards God. We need the gospel. We need the power of his word every single day in our lives. It's not a one-time thing, a one and done. We need it every single day. So it has the power to rescue and the power to restore. But first, let's talk about this piece of rescue. I forgot. There's that wonderful tornado in Kansas. Scary looking things, aren't they? The gospel has the power to rescue. And I want to go to 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. We're going to look at a few different verses in 1 Corinthians 15, and the first one is verse 1 and 2. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Now, it's interesting. He says in this passage, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So Paul is saying to the people he's writing to, I want to remind you that the foundation that you're standing on is the gospel. I want you to consider, because maybe you've been standing on other things. Maybe you've been placing your hope in other things. Maybe there's other things that you think are just as solid or more solid than the gospel. But I want to remind you the gospel is the thing that should be your foundation. So I want to ask you this morning, 
What are the things that you've been putting your hope in? What has been your foundation? Because one of the great things about coming to celebrate Easter is we're reminded of what is really important, what our true foundation is. And I understand there's so many things that are tempting to be drawn to, to find our hope in. I sometimes, sometimes try to find my hope in success. I think if I can just accomplish this or this, then I'll be enough. Then I'll be happy. I'll be fully satisfied. Sometimes I think if my family can be just right, if I can have just the right relationships uh, and just the right situation, that somehow that will be enough. That will satisfy me. Or if I can just be in control of everything in my life. Because when I'm in control, everything goes better. And I want to make sure that nothing gets out of my reach or out of my control. Then maybe I'll be happy. Maybe I'll be satisfied. Or maybe I just want to be comfortable. Maybe when I start to feel uncomfortable, I think something's got to change. Something's got to correct. Comfort is the thing that's going to bring me happiness and hope and satisfaction. But Paul says, the thing on which you stand is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants to remind us of that this morning. I really want you to think, on a day-to-day basis, really think about it, where are you placing your trust and your hope? We so often need to be rescued from the things that we're putting our hope in. This is why we need the gospel every day, but also why we need that initial rescue, because until we know of the power of Jesus Christ and what he can do to satisfy, we find our hope in other places that are less than satisfying. Only God can be everything we need him to be. He's the only thing that can make us whole and complete. Paul goes on to explain the gospel like this in the next couple of verses. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and after that to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. That's a lot of people. Now, Paul tells them this to remind them of this because I think we have a tendency sometimes to add or to take away things from the gospel. We want to add things that we want it to be, that we desire it to be. We want the gospel, whatever it is, maybe it's to bring us more wealth or more comfort or more control, and we sort of add these things in and expect them to be there. But Paul's saying, this is the gospel. And sometimes we take away the things that are hard to understand and that we don't want to be there or that we don't want to do. But Paul says, this is the gospel. I want to be really clear. And I want to be on the same page with all of you this morning as we come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. What is the gospel? What is the story? What are we celebrating? It's that God sent his one and only son because he loved us so much into this world. And he lived a sinless life, a perfect life. It's so hard to believe, but he did it. He was fully righteous in the eyes of God. And then he died and was buried And they thought they had secured the tomb, but he was raised to life on the third day. He had the power to overcome death and to come back to life. And then he appeared to so many people so that they would have no doubt that this is what happened. Now that might be the the nuts and bolts of the gospel. But we're talking about the power of the gospel, right? So what makes the gospel so powerful? When I was 10, we moved to Minnesota, to Owatonna. And... We lived in a neighborhood where a lot of houses kind of backed up to one another, and then, I I know it's, you know, too young to say back in my day, right? But back in that day, you know, we didn't have cell phones and tablets, so we went outside and we played with the neighbor kids, and we ran around the neighborhood, and you just kind of like knew when dinner was going to happen, or you could maybe hear mom off in the distance yelling for you to come home for dinner. We'd go out, we'd run around, we'd play tag and hide and seek and cops and robbers and whatever we could come up with, and football and hockey and basketball and all these things. And one of my good friends, Nathan, was one of these uh, kids that we were with every single day. We hung out, we did everything together for years until we got to high school, and we both played hockey, we were both on the team, but slowly he started to change, and I'm sure I was changing too, but I observed in him that he was just looking for hope and satisfaction and other things in life. He had different friends, he stopped playing hockey, had different pursuits, he tried things like alcohol and drugs that he thought would bring him happiness, and after a while we just kind of faded away and I I didn't see him anymore, and I wondered, what happened to my friend? Where did he go? He, he wouldn't talk to me. And years later, I went to visit a church in Minneapolis, 
And I walked in the door, and who was standing there but Nathan? I couldn't believe it. We hadn't talked in maybe 10 years. And I walked in, and there he was. And we sat down, and we talked, and we caught up, and he told me his full story. He told me about the road trips he went on as he was exploring to figure out who he is and what he was all about, and the different people that he'd journey with and spent time with, and some of the things he'd tried. And he was really honest, and he just shared all the different areas of life that he'd look for hope, that he'd look for satisfaction some of the strange places he'd been and experiences he'd had. But at the end of the day, he said, I met with this older gentleman who sat down with me and shared once again, reminded me like Paul's doing in this passage of what the gospel really is, of where I can truly find my hope. And God came and overwhelmed my life and called me back in. And he wasn't just visiting that church that day, he was on staff at that church that day. And he went on to become a missionary. Right now, he's in Africa ministering to people who don't yet know the gospel. I never would have guessed or bet or predicted or anything that that would have been the outcome of his life based on the trajectory. But God has the power to bring us back into his love and his care. And I have never seen it displayed more clearly than with my friend Nathan. The power of the gospel is great. And Paul wants us to see that when we are powerless, when we are searching, we are lost, when we're putting our hopes and our foundations in the wrong thing, that's when he draws near to us. Paul points this out in Romans. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. While we were still powerless, hopeless, looking for our hope, our satisfaction, our foundation, and other things, Christ moved towards us in his love and in his power and brought us in. Christ did the work to bring us to himself. We don't have the power on our own to be healed or satisfied or rescued. But because of his love, God rescued us and moves towards us and did the work on the cross so that we could be united with him so that we could stand before God without sin or blemish, and he would see us as he sees his son. So I just want to ask you this morning, are you still trying to find your power, your satisfaction, your hope in other things, or have you found it yet in Jesus? If you aren't sure yet, maybe you're still taking some time to explore, I encourage you, to come to God's word. Because the power of God's word is that he points us to the redeeming story of Jesus where we can clearly see who he is and what he's done. And he draws us into himself. And maybe you don't have a Bible. If you're new here today, if you're visiting, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to gift you a Bible. We have some brand new Bibles I'd love to share with you. God's word is so powerful in our lives. He uses it to show himself to us. So you might be asking, okay, I'm curious, I'm kicking the tires of Christianity here, what must I do to be rescued? What must I do to be rescued? It's simple, because God did all of the work for us. That's the beauty of the resurrection, that's why we come to celebrate. We just believe the story of God, his redeeming story, the gospel that he lived, he died, he was resurrected, and we turn away from pursuing those things that don't bring happiness into our lives. And we repent and turn from our sins and our mistakes and ask God to forgive us. And we place our full trust in him and submit to him as our Lord and Savior. And when we do that, he freely receives us and rescues us from a hopeless life that does not satisfy in any other way. The gospel has the power to pick us up and rescue us from any situation we're in, but it also has the power to sustain. And maybe you're here this morning and you've thought, I know what to expect it's Easter Sunday. I'm going to hear the story of the gospel and the resurrection. I've heard it so many times before. But the great thing about the gospel is there is no end to the number of times we need to hear it in our lives. And that's how I want to spend our next few minutes this morning. The gospel has the power not just to rescue but to sustain us, to keep us moving towards God. I want to go back to those first couple of verses in our passage and revisit this with a new lens. It says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel which I preached to you, 
which you received, which you've taken your stand. I want to remind you, Paul's saying you need to be reminded. I already know you've received this. He's speaking to believers, people who he's preached the gospel to before, but he says you need to hear it again. Why does Paul do this? Why does he repeat what he's already told them? His time is limited, right? He's only writes so many letters to churches and brings so many encouraging words, but why does he take the time to repeat the gospel? Because he knows that it has the power to sustain them, to keep them moving towards God. He knows we need the power of the gospel in our lives every single day. It's not a one-time thing. I think this is something that sometimes we overlook in the church. It's easy to sometimes grow up just thinking, well, I just need to say the prayer and be saved and put my faith in God, and then I don't really need to worry about it anymore. But Paul says we need to be reminded all the time of what Jesus has done for us. Paul, the author of Corinthians and so many other books, knows how important it is for us to be sustained by God's word. In Romans 6, he says this. He's not ever content with where he's at. He says, well then, even though I've been rescued, should we keep on sitting so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? We've become a new creation. We can't remain where we were. We have to keep moving towards God to become like Christ. The gospel doesn't just exist for our rescue. It exists to help us move towards holiness, to move towards Jesus each day of our lives until we're united with him for eternity. I was studying this and reading through this week, and I came across a quote from author D.A. Carson. It just struck me to the core and convicted me. I want to share with you this morning and really just let it sink in what he's trying to say to us about the need for the gospel in our lives every single day. He says, people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise, and we call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience, and we call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and we call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and we call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we've escaped legalism. And we slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. Do you find yourself in here? I do. I'm a drifter. I've drifted. I've drifted towards disobedience and I've called it freedom. And freedom seems so good. Why would I not want that? I am so good sometimes at litigating or convincing myself towards following my own desires instead of moving towards holiness. But God's word steps in to powerfully remind us of the gospel, of what Jesus did the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, the power of the Bible is too strong, too life-giving, and too necessary for us to just be okay with drifting wherever the wind blows or wherever the wind takes us. We need the power of the gospel forcefully moving in our lives towards God each and every day. You maybe heard this before, but it's kind of like a sailboat. Assuming your sailboat does not have a motor. If you're in this boat and you don't have your sail up, you're going to go wherever the current takes you. You're just going to drift to one side or the other, this way or that way. There's nothing to guide you and power you. But when you put your sail up and you let the wind blow you, that wind powers you to move forward. And in the same way, God can power us forward with his grace and his love. How do we combat our tendency to drift? We can't just paddle harder and try really hard. We have to be powered by God, specifically by his grace in our lives. God gives us tools to do this. One of them is the blood of Christ. That's what we're here to celebrate this morning, his conquering of death. Ephesians says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. God brings us close to him through this story of Easter, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He draws us near. It's not by our own efforts 
that we are moved towards holiness. It is through God's efforts. The power is in the blood of Jesus. First Peter says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ. With the precious blood of Christ. We can move towards God. We can only do this by relying on him. His death and resurrection created this path from us to God that didn't exist otherwise, and now we get to walk that path because of the work that he did. We can only move towards God because of his grace. As we consider what is it like to be someone who is aware of and utilizes this grace-given tool of the blood of Christ, Matt Chandler puts it this way. He says, the mark of those who understand the gospel of Jesus Christ is that when they stumble and when they fall, when they screw up, when they run to God, when they screw up, they run to God, not from him. Because they clearly understand that their acceptance before God is not predicated on their behavior, but on the righteous life of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death. We know that we're going to make mistakes. Even after we're rescued from God, we know we're going to stumble, we know we're going to fall. But God loves us. Not God loves us because we did this. God loves us, and when we fall, we can run to him. And that is the mark of someone that is trusting in the blood of Christ, trusting in the work that he's done for us. So that's the first tool and what we celebrate on Easter. The second thing is the word of God. How do we move With a grace-powered effort towards God instead of our own effort every single day, we trust in his word. We looked in the first week in this series about how his word is inspired by God and God breathed. It can help us to discern what is true and what is false in our world. Maybe you've had an experience where you've gone to work and your boss has called you out in front of everybody. And it just, you just want to hide. It just puts this like pit in your stomach. And you're feeling condemnation and shame. And you want to feel better. You want to feel satisfied. You want to have hope. So you run down to Taco John's and you buy 10 tacos. And by like the eighth one, you realize you could never eat 10 tacos. Who are we kidding? By the third one, you realize you could never eat 10 tacos. But we try to find our happiness in other places. And the Bible wants to guide us back. Maybe you've been struggling financially recently. And you just think, if my family could somehow just make like $10,000 more per year, we would truly be happy. We would truly be satisfied. The Bible has so much to say about money and about where we find our satisfaction. Or maybe you just think, if I just took the right picture and the right light and posted a picture on social media and got at least 50 likes, that's reasonable, right? Just 50 likes, then I would know that I'm enough. The Bible helps us discern how to move towards God, how to know what is truly satisfying. God speaks through his words directly to us. And it helps us to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Am I hearing the Holy Spirit right now? Or is Satan telling me lies? How can I discern the difference? The Bible is the tool that helps us to hear correctly. It can be hard to tell because sometimes... We feel convicted, or maybe I'm not sure, maybe I'm feeling condemned. But both the Holy Spirit and Satan have the ability to use God's words even to speak to us in a way that accomplishes two different things. And we need the Bible to help us understand. Because both have the ability to make us see and be aware of our weaknesses. Satan wants to discourage us. He wants to say, you're terrible at this. You're not enough. You're not good enough. And God says, I want to sharpen you and help you grow and become more holy and more like me. How do we tell the difference? How do do I not walk off the stage this morning feeling like, boy, that just didn't land or that didn't work? How can I tell if that's God convicting me and saying I need to sharpen something, or it's Satan going, I want to discourage you so that you come up second service and don't have any confidence to speak the truth of God? How do we... Say... The Bible is there to equip us to discern the difference. Satan uses gospel truths to condemn, to accuse, to discourage, and to bring doubt into our minds and our life. But the Holy Spirit brings the gospel to mind to convict us and to comfort us. So if we're taking stock of some of our sins and our failures and our shortcomings, 
and we're just feeling shamed and condemned, we need to use God's word to rebuke Satan, to push him out, to be reminded of the gospel in our lives. God's word is a tool of grace in our lives that moves us towards him, that moves us towards holiness and satisfaction. We cannot afford to be drifters, to go here or there. The power found in the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus has the power to sustain us. The blood of Christ and God's word can be the source of that power. And God's word can powerfully rescue us in a world that does not satisfy even our deepest longings. And God's word can powerfully sustain us by propelling us and moving us towards him. So this morning, as we come to close, I hope you've been considering these questions. The first one is, have you been rescued? Have you placed your trust in God? Are you still putting your hope in something else? Maybe you're just considering it. Maybe you're sure that this is a time that you want to choose to follow God because nothing else has worked. If you even have questions or that's a decision you want to make this morning, go ahead, open up that bulletin, mark on that connection card, and put it in the box. I'd love to talk with you. I will see that. God's word is so powerful, we cannot afford to live without it. Now, are are you a drifter? Or have you been powered by grace to move towards the holiness of God? It's so easy to drift. It's so easy to wander off. It takes intentionality. It takes the power of God to move us towards him. We can't just go from here or there. We're either moving and drifting away, or we're intentionally coming towards God by his grace. What is causing you to drift? And then lastly, as we come to the conclusion of this series, are you seeking God through his word? There is nothing more powerful and more clear in our understanding of who God is and what we find in his word. And as we continue to journey on studying and learning together, we're going to come back to this every single time to know how to live our lives, to know how to be rescued by God, to know who he is and why he loves us so deeply. And some of the most powerful words spoken in this book come to us from 1 Corinthians 15. As we come to a close this morning, I want to share these words with you because if nothing else, I want you to hear the power of God through his own words as he speaks to us through scripture. He says this, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have made victory over death. You have not left us to be searching and wandering and looking for hope and looking for satisfaction all on our own. God, thank you for the power that is found in your word, the power that is found in this gospel story of sending your son to the earth to live this life, to die, and to be raised again. God, I pray that we would find that power when we come face to face with you. God, I pray that if there's people in this room right now who are questioning whether or not they should trust you, that you would move towards them in such a loving way that they would place their trust in you this morning and begin to live that transformed life that your word talks about as they become more holy like you. God, help us to love one another, to care for one another this morning as we gather, but also to look to you as we give praise and thanks for all that you've done in our lives and in this world. God, you are so good. We're so thankful. In your name, amen.